January 28, 1986, NASA is about to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger. The event is broadcast live on TV because, for the first time, a civilian is on board, alongside the crew of six astronauts. They decided to make that the first flight that an ordinary citizen can fly, and that drew a tremendous interest from the public. The civilian in question is a school teacher. So, in classrooms across the United States, starry-eyed children are watching the event live. But just one minute after takeoff, the shuttle explodes and all seven people on board are killed instantly. A few months later, an investigation revealed that the explosion was due to a gas leak. It was too cold on the day of takeoff, so the joints failed to seal properly. America was shocked to discover that the engineers had warned their managers dozens of times about the potential dangers of the seals, even calling an emergency meeting the day before liftoff to beg NASA not to launch the shuttle. There isn't what they wanted to hear. In fact, uh, Larry made a comment Thackle, when the hell do you want me to launch? Next April? Despite this, NASA was so confident in the launch that, unlike other shuttles, it didn't even have an escape system for the crew in the event of a problem. As you can imagine, the media couldn't pass up an opportunity like this. Flight of the American Space Shuttle has ended in disaster. Everyone asks the same question. How could they let this happen? What's incredible is that this media reaction is repeated every time there is a disaster. There is always someone, somewhere, who warned that something could go wrong. And there are always decision makers who ignore the danger. Take the the FTX case. How could investors give millions to a guy on amphetamines who plays League of Legends during his calls? Or the infamous Titan submarine explosion that killed five people in June 2023? How could these people have boarded a submarine piloted by a plastic video game controller? And even the sinking of the Titanic itself in 1912. Why didn't they have enough rescue boats for everyone? Public opinion sees these disasters as lessons in what not to do. But the problem is that the conclusions we draw from those events are often wrong. The lesson that comes with each catastrophe is a warning against hubris, pride and excessive ambition. Look here for the sinking of the Titanic, a symbol of capitalist hubris. Even worse for the submarine explosion where James Cameron himself declared that the arrogance and the hubris that sent that ship to its doom is exactly the same thing that sent those people in that sub to their fate. Same thing for FTX. FTX's spectacular collapse was due to hubris, incompetence and greed. And of course, it's the same with Challenger. Here, hubris created Challenger disaster. And here the Guardian headlines bluntly. Challenger disaster. You can't say we weren't warned about American hubris. Except it's too easy to blame it on hubris. Because what's the lesson we're supposed to learn? Never do anything remotely ambitious if someone somewhere predicts it will go wrong? In fact, we don't talk about hubris when someone raises millions for an audacious startup and succeed. We didn't talk about hubris after Kennedy's famous speech announcing that we would go to the moon because in the end, it worked. Take the story of Kali Carico, a scientist working on a new type of vaccine. One of her collaborators said of their project, Most people laughed at us. A few lines later in the same article, Kali Carico announces after a successful experiment, I felt like a god. This is literally the definition of hubris in Greek tragedies, when a person thinks they are a god. And yet, no one accuses Dr. Carico of hubris because after years of hard work, her bizarre idea finally worked. Her work laid the foundations for mRNA vaccines which were highly effective against COVID-19 and are considered a promising avenue for vaccines against other diseases, such as AIDS. It also won her the Nobel Prize. So hubris is a retrospective word that people apply to ambitious projects that didn't work out and which prevents us from seeing the real lessons to be learned. Nor can we blame everything on managers who are out of touch with reality and make decisions without suffering the consequences. Because the CEO of the submarine company died trapped inside the vessel. Sam bankman fried ended up ruined along with his customers. And NASA was forced to halt its space program for 32 months after Challenger. But if it's not hubris, and if it's not managers out of touch with reality, how do we explain the completely absurd decisions that led to these tragedies? The answer is that decisions which seem completely irrational today were perfectly reasonable at the time they were made. And even worse, if you had been in their place, you would probably have done the same thing. The day before the tragic Challenger launch, the engineers had an emergency call with NASA. They were worried because the weather forecast for the following day was icy and they thought the rubber seals might pose a problem during the launch. They had been writing memos for years warning of the danger of these seals in low temperature conditions. At one point, an engineer literally begged the NASA managers not to authorize the launch. But the managers just ignored them. And after they went offline, Al McDonald was visibly upset. And he said, I wouldn't want to be the guy that had to appear at a board of inquiry if this thing blows. 
And I said, I understand that, Alan, you won't have to. That'll be me. At least that's how the media portrayed the situation after the disaster. Seen from this angle, it's hard not to be stunned by the stupidity of the managers. But a sociologist at Columbia, Diane Vaughan, spent years digging into the archive to understand what really happened. She discovered that the managers had excellent reasons for not listening to the engineers. The very engineers who authored the memos and protested the Challenger launch had repeatedly recommended that NASA managers accept risk and fly. In other words, they had been documenting for months that the seals didn't work as well in low temperatures, but it wasn't enough to prevent a launch. The reason they were all panicking on the eve of the launch was that the weather was forecast to be abnormally cold. On the day before Challenger, there was an overnight low that was record-breaking. Got a telephone call from one of the program managers back in Utah that worked for me. And he says, Al, he says, we just heard that it might get down as low as 18 degrees by tomorrow morning. Good grief, I said, I'm really worried about these O-ring seals being able to operate properly at those kind of temperatures. But since they had always maintained that low temperatures did not pose a major risk, the information was contradictory. So at the time, the managers felt they were making a sensible decision in line with a procedure that had been in place for years. They considered that given the shuttle's proven reliability, the level of risk was acceptable. What was driving here? What, what was to be achieved that uh, caused you to go? But how did we arrive at an acceptable risk that resulted in the death of seven people? Vaughn calls it the normalization of deviance. Every time something goes well, you increase the acceptable risk by a fraction of a percent. Even with the worst erosion they'd ever had, it hadn't failed. So they started to work on it, but they really weren't rushing. It didn't seem so terrible, but they continually expanded the bounds of acceptable risk. Clearly unsafe practice becomes considered habitual, normal, if it does not immediately cause a catastrophe. Gradually, in their formal engineering risk assessments, the work group accepted more and more risk. Each of these decisions taken singly seem correct, routine, and indeed insignificant and unremarkable. Hearing this, you might be tempted to say that we need more regulation and more oversight. But Vaughn shows that, ironically, NASA's bureaucracy and regulations helped normalize deviance and were partly to blame for the Challenger disaster. As you can imagine, at NASA, the slightest little change gives rise to endless memos, notes, and calculations, all rigorously documented. The procedures are numerous and cumbersome. We can call it the by-the-book bias. NASA employees' judgment was impaired by the fact that they felt they were following all the rules correctly. Interviews showed that the working engineers and managers assigned to shuttle hardware had not lost sight of the inherent riskiness and developmental nature of the technology. Many reported praying before every launch. Many experienced a gut check or a nauseatingly tight stomach every time countdown proceeded to its final stages. In spite of their concerns about escalating O-ring problems, they reported a belief in their official launch recommendations. If they followed all the rules, all the procedures, then they had done everything they could to reduce residual risk and to assure safety. Something similar happened during the sinking of the Titanic. The question that often comes up is, why weren't there lifeboats for everyone? But in fact, the shipping company that owned the Titanic had added more lifeboats than the legal minimum required. The problem was that the legal minimum had not been updated since 1894 and was therefore inadequate for the Titanic's unprecedented size. The same thing happened during the crisis call on the eve of the Challenger explosion. The engineers had a hunch, but not enough data to prove that the seals were going to pose a problem. He said, I can't prove it to you. All I know is that it's away from goodness in our experience base. But the engineers at that call didn't have the data. The managers looked over the procedure. Everything had been followed correctly, and no one had ever set a temperature limit, so there was no reason to cancel the launch. Vaughn explained that the best way to avoid this bias is to allow for cases where the procedure doesn't apply. The fact that engineers were terrified on the eve of the launch, even if they had no solid data to back up their fears, should have been enough to postpone the launch. But that wasn't part of the procedure. No one wanted this to happen, but intuition, you know, I don't feel good about this, should have been okay. And they applied all the usual rules in a situation where the usual rules didn't apply. Every day, all over the world, millions of people make decisions. Every now and then, one of these decisions leads to a catastrophe. And then, the press and the investigators go into everything that happened and discover that there were some glaring errors. 
but why? The first answer to this mystery is that the world is complex. Even NASA with its massive brain power and complicated procedures is not immune to accidents. Mistakes happen everywhere all the time and if you go looking for them, you will find them. And of course, there is a huge selection bias. We don't conduct an in-depth investigation of rockets that take off with no issues. Take the example of a startup founder who is about to demo his product. Problem? The product doesn't function properly. So the founder hacks together a misleading demo to make it look as if the product worked fine. What do you think about that? Is this a huge red flag meaning that no one should ever trust this founder? Indeed, this kind of fake product demo was at the heart of the Elizabeth Holmes fraud with Theranos, her blood testing company. But consider this anecdote. At the time of the first iPhone demo in 2007, the product was completely buggy. The iPhone could play a section of a song or a video, but it couldn't play an entire clip reliably without crashing. It worked fine if you sent an email and then surfed the web. If you did those things in reverse, however, it might not. Hours of trial and error had helped the iPhone team develop what engineers called the golden path, a specific set of tasks performed in a specific way and order that made the phone look as if it worked. If you had been behind the scenes at that moment, what would you have thought? Was Jobs demonstrating the resourcefulness that is essential to any entrepreneur, or was he lying to the whole world? The final judgment depends very much on the outcome. In this case, the iPhone was a huge success, so it's seen as a cool unexpected anecdote about a visionary entrepreneur. But if the iPhone had been a failure that had bankrupted Apple, you can be sure that the very same story would have been in the press as a proof that Jobs was caught up in a mad delusion of grandeur. The problem is that in our lives and in our businesses, we have to make decisions without knowing how they're gonna turn out. If you stop everything at the slightest problem, you will never get anywhere. But if you ignore too many issues, there is a normalization of deviance, which means you accept bigger and bigger risks. To continue with the rocket example, when reading Walter Isaacson's new book on Elon Musk, it's striking how SpaceX's whole competitive advantage, which has enabled it to cut costs by a factor of three compared with NASA, well, this competitive advantage is based on ignoring most of NASA's complicated procedures. There are dozens of anecdotes where a solution to a problem is improvised on the fly and Musk decides to launch anyway. Take the story of the hairdryer. Our antenna got wet. An employee recalls. And we weren't getting a good telemetry signal. A typical SpaceX fix was improvised. They fetched a hairdryer and an employee waved it over the antennas until the moisture was gone. You think it is good enough to fly tomorrow? Musk asked him. The employee replied, It should do the trick. Musk stared at him silently for a while, assessing him and his answer, then said, OK, let's do it. Compared with Challenger, the big difference is that there were no humans in the rocket, so Musk can afford to take more risks. But even with no human at risk, when you blow up a satellite worth a few hundred million that belongs to your customer, it's still a bit embarrassing. So what Musk needs to do is properly assess which problems pose a real danger. NASA can't do that because there is no big boss who can make gut calls. NASA answers to the government and so all their decisions have to be consistent and documented. Paradoxically, this makes them vulnerable to the by-the-book bias and the normalization of deviance. The anecdote continues. The important thing with Elon, an employee reveals, is that if you told him the risks and showed him the engineering data, he would make a quick assessment and let the responsibility shift from your shoulders to his. This question of responsibility is crucial if you want to learn the right lessons. Carol Tavris has written an entire book on the subject. The book is called Mistakes Were Made. But they were made by whom? The passive voice allows the person not to specify and certainly not to say, I made mistakes. Here's how Henry Kissinger responds to accusations of war crimes in Vietnam. Mistakes were quite possibly made by the administrations in which I served. Here's how a cardinal addresses the issue of abuse committed by priests. If, in hindsight, we also discover that mistakes may have been made, I am deeply sorry. And here's how McDonald's apologizes to its vegetarian customers, to whom it forgot to mention that the potatoes were flavored with beef. Mistakes were made in communicating to the public and customers about the ingredients in our french fries and hash browns. People rarely make a bad decision knowingly. At the time, the decision seemed justifiable. The first problem is that the public falls into hindsight bias, thinking that the mistake was obvious all along. This prevents us from learning the real lesson, which is that the world is complex and that we too, one day, could make a big mistake. But on the other hand, people who have made the mistake fall into consistency bias, where they feel obliged to justify their past decisions. These two psychological biases create a vicious circle. The more the public condemns decisions that seem obviously wrong, the more the decision maker is tempted to justify himself. The more the decision 
maker justifies himself, the more it proves to the public that he is arrogant, stupid, evil, or all three. That's why Sam bankman fried is portrayed as Satan's own grandfather by the YouTubers following the case, and as a poor little nerd who slept through his accounting classes by his lawyers. Of course, the truth is somewhere in between. Or take Elizabeth Holmes, who tells the New York Times that her Theranos blood testing company could have worked. What does she think would have happened if she hadn't garnered so much early attention as the second coming of Silicon Valley? Miss Holmes does not blink. We would have seen through our vision. At one point, Sam bankman fried said the same thing. If my lawyers hadn't pressured me into declaring bankruptcy, I could have saved the company. The question in both cases is, are they lying to us or are they lying to themselves? I think they are really lying to themselves. In both cases, their companies are dead and buried and they're in jail. Lying about it doesn't do them any good, especially since nobody believes them. So they have to believe it. And it makes sense. They believed it all along. Because otherwise, what was the plan for these two? Lie for a few years, then get caught and end up in jail? I'm haunted by this quote from physicist Richard Feynman. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Clearly, the submarine CEO believed in his machine, or he wouldn't have gone down in it. At some point, they all convinced themselves that everything was going to be okay. Except that the deviance was normalized to the point where Elizabeth Holmes agreed to deploy her defective machines to real patients, and Sam bankman fried stole everyone's money. They are both clearly guilty and deserve their punishment. I was a victim of psychological bias is no defense in court. But it is an explanation that helps us understand how otherwise intelligent people have made mistakes that seem at first glance obvious. All the biases we've talked about throughout this video, whether it's normalization of deviance, by the book bias, hindsight bias, or consistency bias, boil down to one very simple thing, our need for certainty. The world is complex. And instead of saying, I don't know, we judge other people's mistakes as if we could have easily avoided them. And we judge our own decisions as if we never made any mistakes. We more than doubled the subscriber count on this channel in the last month. If we keep doubling every month, we'll reach 15 million subscribers by the end of next year, meaning we're on track to destroy our goal of 100k subscribers by December 31, 2024. What could go wrong, right? It's just math. Anyway, you're still super early to the channel. Subscribe and let me know in the comments what number you are. It will be fun to look back after I pass Mr. Beast in less than two years. Wait, what? In the meantime, if you want to see my best video to date, click here to see why everyone in succession is bad at business.